right, we're going to move right on to our second presentation of the day. And this is everything that you would ever want to know about training a fighter or working in a corner. We have a gentleman who has done about as much of those two things as anyone in the business worldwide. He's the president and founder of SJC Boxing in Fort Myers, Florida. He serves as the vice <coughs> president of the Florida Boxing Hall of Fame Board of Directors. And he himself, a 2009 <coughs> Florida Boxing Hall of Fame inductee. That was the original class. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Steve Cantor. <laughs> Thank you, Bob, and thank you, everybody, for being here. The Hall of Fame weekend is my favorite weekend of the year. I get to see friends I hadn't seen in years, some I have, but this is fabulous. Everybody gets together, it's a family reunion, as we mentioned in the previous one. When you don't see each other for years and you get together, you let leave off like, like it was yesterday. And that's the way family is, and that's what I love about this thing. Seeing old friends, seeing people like Jimmy Williams, he embarrassed me a little bit a couple years ago. That he's telling everybody that he and I have been friends longer than most people have been alive. Yeah. <laughs> I said, you ain't that old like you. <laughs> but I love this man. I love all the people that are here. And we're here for a reason. We're here to honor the great fighters who are being inducted. And many of the champions from the past come here to welcome the new inductees. And future inductees are here to enjoy the weekend, so that's what's good about it. What saddens me and some of the old fighters a little bit is to see the fighters today who are great athletes, have great desire, lacking teachers. There's no proper teaching today. There's good athletes. There's people that can become great. And you go and you watch a fight and certain things happen. And in this fight, what happens now and what happened before is totally different. You hear things today which cracks me a lot. You hear the word styles make fights. That's a cliche, and I hate that cliche. And you hear it all the time. You didn't hear that years ago. You used to hear fighters make fights. If you analyze things, you analyze the expression styles make fights, what you're really saying is, I got one style. I'm at the mercy of my matchmaker who put me in a ring to make me look good against whatever style you have. Mm -hmm. And if I don't look good, because I can't change or adapt, styles make fights. Now, fighters make fights. If you are versatile, and the fighters in the past who were versatile, you'd go in a ring and you'd watch a fight. Round one would happen. Somebody would win, somebody would not. Round two is a completely different fight. The one who didn't win changes. He adapts. He comes back, now he takes the play away. Then fighter number three comes back, third round, and he comes back and it's back and forth. You had an ebb and flow. You had, you didn't ever know who was going to win until the fight ended because it would ebb and flow all the way through. Today you can watch a fight and you watch round one and nothing changes. It's the same every round because they can't adapt. They're there doing what they can do. And the thing about it, if you become versatile and you use your head like people in the past have talked about cerebral, you look at a guy and see what he does, and if you fight him in a style that he can't fight, he can't win. If you fight him in a style that he can fight, you're giving him his one chance to win, and it makes the fight hard. That's what you have today. They stand there, you see no head movement. The only head movement you see is when it's not being knocked around by the punches that land. You don't hear the science, the science is gone. The old teachers like, like Jimmy, like Kenny, who have loved this guy for years. You know, we're here for a reason, but what scares me is what's the future going to be? You know, you see kids, again, good athletes, being trained, desired. Uh, you go into gyms, you see them playing games with these mitts. I'll talk about that in a little bit. But the old fighters didn't have mitts. Okay? But you can use mitts if you use them properly. No one today uses them properly because I see the trainers today do this fancy stuff and then they look to the camera, look at me. What's the job of the trainer? The job of the trainer is to make the fighter look good. You're supposed to prepare the fighter physically and mentally for the fight. Correct? Why are they worrying about how they look on there? And what's all this fancy stuff? 
There's no feet movement. There's no hips movement. There's all this fancy stuff, all this sounds making. No. And slapping at them, and injuring their hands, and training them to fight two-headed fighters. Jab over here, and throw their right hand over here. But when you get in the ring, your target's here. Right down the pipe, bomb, bomb. So why am I being taught to throw a jab this way, which shortens my reach, sticks my chin up, hit me, then come back and throw a right hand over here? It's a two-headed guy? I don't know. Or a big head, I don't know. But I see all this stuff, and it, it really bothers me. I had trouble watching the fighters fight today, and I love the sport. And in my gym, fighters and some fighters here in the room that I've been in the gym with. Oscar was 14 when he started in the gym with me. I was 41 then. So he was 41 now. I said, I ought to be 14. <laughs> but this, this guy here, he didn't talk much about his boxing. But I'll tell you something, he could have been a great. He was a super fighter. His cousin fought, was a top fighter, top rated fighter, Miguel Montilla. Fought Antonio Cervantes for world titles twice, went the distance. Fought Aaron Pryor in a great fight. He was destined for that. But after being a great fighter, coming up, and he was crazy too, I'll tell you that. He was young and he was eating soup before, or drinking soup every time he'd fight. I said, what do you have soup for? He said, I'm highly superstitious. <laughs> I said, it really work like that. I said, he quit having the soup. You know, I don't know like that. But this guy came and was a great fighter. He told me something very telling. He says he noticed if he's fighting a guy who's good looking, he doesn't worry too much about it. He hits him once and they run. If he's matched with an ugly fighter, he tells me, I got to fight. This guy is a great I can beat him at that no matter what. It's a hard fight. I learned stuff from this guy, I tell you. So now he's out of service. He's running the amateur program. I'm happy. He's doing a great job with him. Oscar. Let's hear it. about training now. Uh, and, and Bob was saying, I'm going to tell you everything there is about training. Now, we'd be here about a couple of months. <laughs> we don't have a couple of months. We've got a short time. So I'm going to try to keep it short with hit the main <coughs> First of all, in boxing, uh, you have to become versatile. You have to have fun. You have to relax. You can't be uptight. Uh, I see people who work we, we, in our gym, we've been 28 years in Fort Myers. We've had 10 professional world champions from our gym. Many world champions that were not my fighter trained there. Fort Myers is a small city, right? We've had 72 countries around the world trained in our gym. That's second to Gleason Gym in New York City for a number of different countries. Yeah. I, I'm proud of that. That's pretty good. But when they come in here, what happens is that's how it used to be. We train people at night. People say, well, why do you train at night? I said, because it's what you need to do for a fighter. Fighters fight at night. You train them at night. I said, we, we have no air conditioning. It's 100 something degrees in the gym. Why? Fighters fight in the heat. But we train in the heat. We train at night. I'd rather be at home watching TV at night. It's not fair to the fighter. I've been there in the afternoon if we're fighting in Europe because of the time change. We train Monday to Friday. But I've been there on weekends if fighters fighting for titles. I've been there Christmas Day. New Year's Day, Thanksgiving Day in the past with the certain fighters fighting. But you do what's right for the fighter, not what's right for you. Who cares what, what, you're, what you're there for is for the fighter? Who cares anything else about anything but the fighter that you, if you're doing your job, right? Mm -hmm. So what happens to a fighter? you got to look at things. If you have proper technique, it allows you to do things properly. If you have bad technique, it's impossible to do things correct. It prevents you from doing things properly, and that's the key. How many times have you heard a trainer tell a fighter, reset? All the time, you reset, reset. You should never reset. You should be in balance all the time. Right. Boxing's like a top. It spins. You stick on the top spinning. As long as the balance there, it'll spin indefinitely. It's off a little bit, then it's worse, then it's worse, then it flies away. Yeah. Fighter today throws one, two punches, and you off balance. Reset! or tell him what to do during the round so his opponent knows what's coming. That's crazy. I mean, I, heard, I had a fighter, you guys remember me, Freeman Barr was inducted last year. I'll never forget this. He was in a fight and the, the manager in the, in the corner of his opponent says, double left hook. Freeman lands a double left hook. He goes like that. The guy says, 
Get with an uppercut. He hit a ball, he nails with it. Is that what you want? I mean, stuff is crazy. What you gotta do, first of all, is look at the situation again for the fighter. You get in the gym, train the fighter to fight, mentally and physically. How many people know fighters that are great physically and mentally they're weak? You've got to have mental strength and physical fitness. And the trainer has to be both. What concerns me, or not concerns me, but I kind of, in a way, it's humorous. Today, you have a trainer, an assistant trainer or two, a massage therapist, a nutritionist, a hypnotist. <laughs> what else we got? We got a matchmaker and a, and a manager, an assistant manager, and a promoter. And you got all these hangers on, right? And the fighters say, I'm in the best shape of my life after four rounds of fire. In the old days, you had a manager who turned his fighter over to the trainer and nothing else. And they went 15 rounds nonstop. You see fighters today get in the ring, the feet are so wide. I'm waiting for someone like Bob Alexander, who I think is one of the best in the world. Fighting out of the red and blue corner. <laughs> it's, just, it's just unbelievable. But what you got to do is get back to the basics. You train at night, you fight at night. You can't come in the gym at night and do your work. That's two different things. Do the road work in the morning. Let your body recover. Come to the gym at night like you fight. Let your body recover during the night. You can't do them both. You can't run on the treadmill. That's not running. You can do it in addition to, but not in place of. You can't lift weights to me and be a boxer. It's two different muscles. Weights are strength bulk muscles, not stamina, speed, twitch muscles. You have to train like a boxer if you want to be a boxer. If you're a guitar player, you practice the guitar, not the piano. So why are they doing things not related to boxing? You get in the sport, think about your body controlling it like that top. Pretend there's a steel rod that goes through your head into the canvas. On that rod, you can turn this way and go up or down. But you don't want to go this way, this way, this way. You're on balance. And the people will throw, they get the guard and the target's in front of them. So they bring the hand back here to hit the target up here. <laughs> if you're a sprinter and you're in the block and you're standing in the block, you got your foot in the block, they shoot the gun, you don't turn around five yards to get a head start to go this way, do you? then why do you take your punch and bring it back here to go there? They do that all the time. They got no balance or so. And there's no head movement, like I said, which is crazy. You should be able to stand in the pocket right in front of the guy, like Wilfredo Benitez, and go back and look at the video. And you can throw punches all day long and nothing lands. And yet, nothing's landing because what is he doing? He's not watching anything coming at him. Like today, again, the difference. Fighters today, it's your turn, my turn, correct? You're on offense, I'm on defense. And as soon as you're done, I'm throwing. And you go back and forth. You're supposed to be in offense and defense simultaneously. Okay? Now, the way you do that today, what they're doing is they're watching what's coming. They always say, oh, it's what you don't see is what hurts you. You don't see it because you're watching something else. You want to get rid of what's coming at you automatically without watching it. You look in the center, you see the feet, you see the weight shift, you see the punches coming, you see the head movement, you see all this. You look there, okay? Now the punch comes, you get rid of it automatically, don't look at it. Get rid of it, because what you're looking at, what's next, where is the open? That's all you're constantly doing. Relax, having fun, what's next, where is the open? Get rid of it, get rid of it, get rid of it, throw your shots. That's, that you have fun that way. The jab, they say, is the top punch in boxing. You hear everybody say that been from the beginning, right? It's true. And since it's true, why don't they do that today? You don't see anyone for throwing jabs. And if they throw a jab, what do they throw on? A lazy jab, nothing on it. Drop the hand, hit me on the way back. The jab is, if you have a person who is a great listener, who is in great condition, anybody can get in shape by training, correct? Anybody can listen if they want to. And if you teach that person who can listen, who's in shape, there's two other things. Teach them good footwork. Perfect footwork and a jab. And nothing else. That person will win 90% of his pro fights. The condition will keep them going throughout the fight. 
the jab will pile up points offensively and keep them off you defensively, and your feet will put you in and out of range. Now, if you take someone and say, all you gotta do is learn a jab, learn the feet, you get the start, you got the foundation built. You can't build a roof until a foundation is built. You get that done, now you turn around and you stick the right hand behind it, you stick the uppercut, you see, stick the hooks behind it, you throw your combinations. Now you're getting to be a fighter, but everybody wants to be a fighter without working. They want to take shortcuts, right? You take a shortcut, cut corners, you're going to run in circles and get nowhere. Think about that. You take shortcuts, you cut corners, you go in circles and get nowhere. Now, the ABCs of boxing, I've always said from years back, is actually ABD. I shared that with you last night, right? Remember? The ABCs of boxing is ABD. Always be different. If you do the same thing over and over again, I'm going to adapt to it. Look at baseball. Guy throws 95 miles an hour fastball down the middle. You can't catch up to it. He keeps throwing it, you're going to start to hit him. But he mixes in other stuff to it, all of a sudden you're in trouble. So if you're a boxer and you keep doing the same thing over and over again, you're in trouble. Now on top of that, if you're a boxer today, and you're telling your opponent what you're going to throw in advance, shouldn't you be in trouble? The answer is yes, but they're not because they're all doing it. <laughs> there was an expression years ago you don't hear much anymore, again, reading your opponent. You don't hear that too much. When you read your opponent, you know everything about him. It's like a computer in your brain. You know distance, you know what's coming, you know how hard the punches are, you know where he's throwing, you know what he's going to do when you do certain things, right? You use that to your advantage. Instead of just going bang, bang, throwing hard, getting in wars, and then as soon as the fight's over, what are you going to do next? i got to take a vacation. <laughs> difference between a fighter and a champion, a fighter trains when they have a fight coming up. Champion trains all the time. Where is that today? Where is that? I'm afraid for the future. You don't have the teachers. You don't have the trainers. You don't have the people. you got to have the feet, the balance. Uh, you throw punches, but you got to throw them up and down. you got to work the jab. The jab is something that you change. It's not always one jab. It's You change part of it. One, two, three, four jabs. It's location. It's speed. It's power of the jab. That changes all the time. You use the jab to move into the punches. People know another thing too is when you go to a gym, some are short, some are tall, some are slow, some are strong, right? Why do they all fight the same way? You see that today. You never saw it in the old days. I had a kid, 140 pounds, short arms, very strong, <laughs> loved to fight, great, great guy. As an amateur, he had nine losses and three wins out of his 12 fights because his trainer had him on the outside throwing jabs and moving around with short arms, slow hands, and not too tall. And he wanted to be a fighter, so he came in the gym. And his strength was his, his get low, getting inside, get his power punches to the body and up to the head, and taking advantage of his luck, not the height, taking advantage of what he has. So we worked hard in the gym. Freeman Barr used to say that's the worst fighter in the gym he's ever seen who was the best in the ring. <laughs> because he never cared in the gym what he looked like. All he wanted to do was perfect what he was working on. And then reward himself fight night. Fight night's your reward for the hard work. Somewhere the fight has to be hard. Make it hard in a gym. So it's easier in the fight. Sometimes it's hard both places if you're fighting a great fighter. Trash talk. You didn't hear that years ago. And we all get together with all the friends, all the people we have, and you talk about family. Yet they killed each other 20 years ago. They had best friends the rest of their life. Today you hear this guy, he can't fight, he's no good, he's terrible. I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to knock him out. He's had five knockouts in 50 fights, I'm going to knock him out. He's no good. And I said, think about it, you look at our gym, we, we have a different prospect, uh, perspective there. If you tell everybody how bad your opponent is, and when you fight, you're either going to win or not. If you beat him, what did you do? You beat someone who can't fight, big deal. <laughs> if you get beat by him, it is a big deal. Now you got beat by someone who can't fight. <laughs> Think about that. Wouldn't it be better to just tell everybody, I'm fighting a great fighter. I respect him. I'm going to work hard. I'm going to train hard. I'm going to go with a work to beat him, and you better be there to watch because two fighters are going to put on a show. 
when you fight them and beat them, you just beat someone that's great. If you got beat by any beat them by, by somebody great. It makes more sense. That's what you do. You have to show respect to the opponent, to the officials, to the fans that came to pay their money. Uh, you talk, I'm going to go back again a little bit to telegraphy, reading an opponent. Telltale signs. You fight, you see fighters today. Uh, uh, uh. What does the sound do? A couple of things. It tells your opponent, a smart fighter, you're in range. You're right in front of me. You're getting ready to throw a punch. I know what's coming with my eyes closed. I know where you are. They hit you. Not only that, you also tell me when you get tired because the sound changes. Later in the fight, it doesn't sound the same. I hear that you're tired. Now, how many times have you seen someone get hit with a shot? Big smile on their face. Didn't hurt me. And who the announcers even say that he's laughing it off. Must have hurt him. Yeah, I heard. <laughs> right? Now, we teach something different, which we did in the old days, and we still do to this day in my gym. We go in the ring and we have a little smile. Half smile, not big, just a half little smile, relaxed, having fun, okay? Now, what happens is, I get hit with a hard shot, that doesn't change. I land big punches, that doesn't change. I got that small smile like I'm having fun the whole fight, which you are, you're relaxed. Now he can't read anything into it. He has no idea what's going on and they start driving him crazy. I had an amateur in my gym who was a good fighter. I had a pro who was 6-0, weight class heavier, southpaw, comes in sparring with him. And the first time they sparred, my amateur is there with a smile on his face, having fun working. The next time they come in, one of the guys said, you're going to spar with him today. Now, I don't like sparring him. He's always smiling about what, what I do. <laughs> this is an undefeated pro. See, he drives me crazy. Now, you see people, trainers, go in the gym, and they do certain things. First of all, how many times do you see a fighter get in there and they put those 16-ounce weights in their hand and shadow box? happens all the time today, right? What does that do? You've got to hold it tight so it doesn't fly out of your hand. You start throwing punches with your hands tight. Injure yourself. You don't have the speed. You don't have the snap. You, don't, you didn't do that before. You had 16 ounce gloves. Weigh the same thing as those weights. You put 16 ounce gloves on, you relax in there. You work on your speed reflexes. Makes more sense. You see trainers they change the time to training. Oh, we're going to give them a five minute round. We're going to give them a 30 second rest. We're going to give them a four minute round or 30 second rest. You fight a three minute round and you have a one minute rest. You need to learn the clock in your head to utilize it to your advantage during the fight. These are the little things that's missing today, some of these things. Uh, for example, if you watched an old Ray Robinson, my favorite, you bring up so many times yourself. Every time the bell would ring, he'd sit in his corner. He's in his corner when the bell rings. The other guy walks across the ring to his corner. After six or seven rounds, the guy's thinking, damn, every time the bell rings, he's in his corner. Ooh, psychological thing. Now, what's more important than that, though? Suppose I have a cut. I finish the round in my corner and sit down. I got an extra five seconds to, for that cut to be stopped. I might save the fight. On the other hand, if he's cut, you're keeping him out of the corner for those seconds, which may beat him because they can't stop the fight. Okay, now, when the bell rings, everybody's human. The judges start looking at their action, right? You utilize the clock to your favor. You start the round fast. Judges watch, bell rang, everyone's watch. You start fast. Now you might coast a little bit in the middle of the round as the judge's mind is wandering, as everyone else is wandering. Now you turn it up second half because they catch themselves too and they see you finish strong. Round is real close. Three minute round, real close. You might have fought for a minute and a half of the round. Or you might have fought for a minute and he did good for the for two minutes. But first 30 and last 30, you did great. Close round, you get the round. First and last impression. Little things like that. Okay? Now you're you're looking at this and you see guys throw punches and there are people, their distance isn't right. And they're throwing punches in here and are reaching out here for punches, right? Your punches you throw the same way every time. You throw it every time the same way, your feet put you in and out of range. You adjust your distance with your feet, but you don't change your punch. It's like if you're a baseball pitcher, you don't change your delivery for a different batter. You throw it the same way every way, every time. You're a bowler, you throw the ball the same way every time so you can get consistency. You throw your punches in boxing the same way every time. Your feet change your distance. 
and everything is so. Talk about, go back to the jab. I'm bouncing around because I don't, I put notes for people that have, but I don't do too good reading them. But what happens is uh, you look at certain things, like I had a guy, Federico, he was six foot eight, 84 inch reach. Some of the people here remember him. Super nice guy, very intelligent guy, tremendous skill, but he was very green, very brand new, new guy. He's in a Golden Gloves tournament. He's fighting a very, very experienced guy who's about six feet tall, who's been in the pro gym since he's eight years old. Very slick head movement. Now, in the first round, Federico is throwing his long jab. He can't touch him. This guy was slick. He slipped everything, counters. Federico comes to the corner, and he was like, like uh, frustrated, didn't know what to do. He looks at me, he says, I can't touch him with my jab, because he's brand, brand new, he's following instructions, big guy with big reach, and he can't touch him with a jab. And I look at him, I say, great. And he looks at me like, what's wrong? I, like, I didn't hear him, he repeats it. I can't touch him with my jab. I said, great, I don't want you to. He's got great head movement. I want you to use the jab to move him into the punch you're going to hit him with. Mm -hmm. I said, what you do if you want to hit him with the right hand, you jab on this side of his face. You throw the right hand over here, not over here. He runs into it. You want to hit him with an uppercut, jab at his forehead, uppercut. You want him with a hook, jab over here, throw the hook over here. I'm telling this in the corner. I said he was a good wrestler, very green, fighting a good fighter. He goes out there in round two, first seconds of round two, throws a jab and cracks him with a big right hand over here. He turned and looked at me in the corner like, oh my gosh, it works. <laughs> he finished that round cracking him with punches that he moved them into with a jab that he never landed. And when the fight ended, he won the last two rounds big and won the decision over a very experienced fighter. Who would have ever thought a guy six foot eight, 84 inch reach, who had a good jab, could beat a very experienced fighter and never land a single jab the whole fight? Right? Today they say that's unheard of. The old days they say that's boxing. Styles make fights. And that's the thing. You talk about working corners a little bit. You watch the corner, you look, you look at a fight, <coughs> bell rings, fighter comes to the corner, he's standing there waiting 10, 15 seconds for you to get the stool in there. Why? The bell rings, two things are happening. He's supposed to be trained to be in the corner, and you're supposed to have the stool waiting on him. I sit on a stool myself in the corner, and a few seconds before the bell, because I got that minute in my head too, I hold the stool in my hand. Bell rings, it's under the rope. He's in the corner and sits down. Now, I'm coming in there, grab his mouthpiece out, you don't give him water, you don't give him advice, let him get his wind a little bit, get his breathing in, relax a little bit. Then as he's relaxed, then you give him a little sip of water, then you start giving him one voice in the corner not two and three and four voices. And one or two things in the corner that's going to capitalize and result in a win instead of, how do you feel? <laughs> I'm dead tired. I just told him he's dead tired and he's screwed. People here remember David Armstrong, one of my fighters from yes, yes. way back. 118 amateur, 115 amateur fights, 108 wins. Four time, won four titles as a pro. David moved from eight to 12 round fights. He was in his first 12 rounder. And in round seven of that fight, the bell rang, and he stumped, turned and stumbled him back to the corner, dead tired. And I'm thinking in my head, we got five rounds to go. So David is stumbling back to me. I said, hey David, we're in great shape. And he was startled, looks up at me. And I said, I just saw you catch a second wind just before the bell rang. Look at that guy, he's on the stool dying over there. David turned around, this guy leaning over the stool, <laughs> dying. And David thought he caught a second win. Because I told him, just before I saw the second win, so he come back, he gets his breath back, he gets his uh, water, he gets a couple of words with him, he went out there and dominated the last five rounds because he thought he had a second win. <laughs> Instead of, how do you feel? I'm tired. Or, you gotta throw more punches. What do you mean throwing more punches? He's throwing all everything, everything again, nothing's landing. Or he ain't hitting you. So the fighter says, and who is the referee? <laughs> I mean, 
The stuff today, they go in the ring, the guy's waiting there, right? He's getting his, he's, he's not in good shape, and he's spending 20 seconds asking, where's the water bottle? The water bottle, you know, the water, you mean the water bottle. Yeah. You know, all the fighters there. So, so they, you got situations that that's, it's crazy like that. You even have other things that uh, Angelo Dundee, if you remember the famous thing about cutting the glove when uh, Henry Cooper dropped him in round five, and then they came up with the Angelo Dundee rule, you got to have secondary gloves there. There's certain things you have to do occasionally to buy time for your fighter. I'm going to tell you another little story that's kind of interesting. I was at the National with a kid named Scott Erickson. Remember Scotty, the Sandman? He went into the tournament with a bad chest cold. And it just so happened the fight in front of us as we're waiting to get in, the guy was sick too in our corner, the, the fighter. And he started fa fast in the first round. Second round, he ran out of gas and lost. Third, last round, he got beat big time because he was just exhausted. So he's coming down the steps. The trainer's shaking his head. I couldn't do anything. He was just sick. He ran out of gas. I didn't say a word. I got up there with Scotty. Scotty won his first round. Second round was kind of close, but he lost because he started getting, you know, catching up to him, couldn't get his win, couldn't breathe. And we got three rounds to go. I know we're in trouble because he wins one. The second round was close that he may or may not have gotten it, but he'd gone. We got to win this third round. So you got to do something to save your fighter. So somehow I'm in the corner. I don't know how it happened. When seconds out, I knocked this water bucket over. In the corner. Oh. Nobody know how that happened. So the referee got cleaned it up. Right? <laughs> but the towel disappeared. Thank you. Now we had to get a towel. Wiped it up. Fighters oh. resume, right? Somehow they forgot to put his mouthpiece in. <laughs> then he stops and brings it. We can't find the mouthpiece. Oh, here it is. Now we got to rinse it. Now we got to put it on, right? Also, what happened is about a minute and a half into the round is. Wrap started unwrapping. Well, you go in the wraps and you take the corner, you lift it up a little bit, stick a little Vaseline, and put it back down. It's going to start unwrapping the wrap. <laughs> but what happened was, with all these delays, Scotty won round three. He won the title. Can't do anything for guys tired, I guess. I mean, these are things you have to do for your fighter on occasion. You have to look at things like this. You have what's called combinations, right? In boxing, people talk combinations. What does that mean? There's certain sequences of punches, right? An experienced fighter will always tell you the one that gives them the most difficulty is someone who's not experienced. Why is that? Because they throw what's unexpected, correct? Right. Okay. You have you have combinations, and you watch. Again, you read. You watch. I'll throw the jab. I'll throw the uppercut. And what's coming? The hook, right? So you give him that, and you watch him read. Now all of a sudden, you throw this. You throw this. He's looking for the upper. Lean for the uppercut, right? Come right back with a right hand over the top and then back to the upper cut. So he sees this too late, reaches for that, and there's the hook. Reverse it. Combination, reverse combination. Throw away punches. I want to hit him with a shot, and he's a, got good head movement. There's one guy, I'll never forget, so proud of his head movement, he'd smile after he slipped a punch. So you purposely throw a right hand over here, so he goes that way. You know when he's coming back to center. So as it's here, you, you, out just a second, you leave it out just a second. You bring it back as his head's coming, boom, right into a big left hook. Now you're the one smiling. So these are setup punches. You throw away punches. This is the smart part. You gotta work the body, you gotta work the head. You don't just throw head shots, especially if a person has been dropped. As soon as they've been dropped, they get up, everyone goes to the head, and they reach up here, go right to the body, then we come up. Things like that's what you have to teach certain things. Uh, that are gone today, and you you watch these guys. It, it just sad to me because they're good athletes. There's no teachers like Jimmy, like Kenny, like Eddie Futch, like Emmanuel Stewart. You know, that's what's missing today. We need to do things now. Let's go back a little bit to Mitch. Again, I said we didn't have Mitch years ago. You remember that? came later on. Now you got the fancy mid. Guys actually have a title now. They're a mid man. Remember that? They're a mid man. Can't do anything else, but they can do fancy mitts. And, and they stand there, and they do all this fancy stuff. There's no hip movement. There's no feet movement. And everyone says, look how great that is. How is that great? Your opponent doesn't stand still. 
he moves around. Now, you have to throw your punch across. I see people too, other things. You have your stance. Once you have your stance, it should never change. You move your feet with your punches. If I push off the back foot, step into a jab, straight ahead. Now that foot lands where that punch lands. And it comes straight out, and the shoulder's blocking that chin. Not over here. You're short, here, you're shortening your reach. Here I want full extension. Now when I step in, I'm going to put my stance back after that jab. So I'm going to step forward, right? Got my stance. Now if I'm throwing a right hand, I can throw the right hand with that. Together. Boom, I'm right there. Perfect balance. If you have perfect balance, I can change what we call a midstream. You don't hear fighters today in midstream. They're hanging out. I got a great jab, so what happens is I knock them back, and then I throw a right hand, leaning like over, can't reach them. All balance. Feet back here still. And they turn it this way. And a lot of people teach that back foot. You didn't see that many, many years ago. You did fairly recently. I was fortunate to have people that train like Ezra Charles work with me when I was young. And some of the stuff that way back then are missing, these are things that's, that's critical. You've got to start with the foundation. Uh, if a fighter comes in the gym and he's anxious to be a good fighter, and he learns the jab halfway, and the right hand halfway, and the footwork halfway, hooks halfway, when he's all done, what is he? He's a halfway fighter. And, and you see that one after another. It's crazy. Uh, you know, you relax, you have fun, you work hard. You go in the ring and you spar your sparring partner. You're not trying to beat him. That's not the fight. You're not getting paid to beat him. You're getting paid to work on your tech, technical stuff. You go in the ring sparring. Why are you in there trying to kill, kill and hurt your opponent? It's like your opponent's your teammate. If you work with your teammate, learn from your teammate, Respect your teammate. When you fight, who's your biggest fan? Your teammates. When they fight, who are their biggest fans? You. That's how you build that relationship. You don't go in the gym trying to beat everybody because you learn nothing. You're survival of the fittest. You're in there going to war. What? You don't do that. Uh, Mark, I saw Mark fight years ago in Biloxi as a pro and knew about Mark for years. Mark came to our open house in Fort Myers on the 28th year anniversary that we had. And it was a great event. We had fighters from years ago came with the young fighters. People passed the mic around. I got telegrams and messages from people all over the world that train there. We enjoyed having Mark there. I exposed Mark that night because he was working out a little bit that whole few days he was there to a different kind of network. I'm going to let Mark talk in a, in a minute about that, but when I talk about midwork, why do I why do I catch a jab with my left hand? If you watch 90% of the videos, they all catch the jab here. That means I'm throwing the jab, shortening my reach that way, right? Why do, if you're a boxer, you're trained to catch the jab with your right hand. Why doesn't the person with the mid catch the jab with the right hand? Just like in the fight. Simulate the fight. Don't change. What you do in the gym what you, is what you do in a fight. Just like when you're in a corner of the fighter, you cannot tell the fighter to do something he's, he can't do or hasn't worked on in the gym. Now you tell him something different. No, you tell him what he can do. You have to know your fighter, know what he's capable of, what to win. Okay, same thing, you got trained the way you fight. The exact same way you fight in the gym is how you perform there. And actually when you perform, that's your reward for that hard work. You're rewarding yourself now. So you go in there, you catch it the same way. And the right hand, you catch the same way because the target's going on right there, right down the middle. And you sit there and don't start banging at it for a couple of reasons. Number one, he has to learn proper distance to get that full extension and turn and snap on his punch. And how can he learn that if you're coming at him with hands? Also, you can roll his wrist, injure his hands. His hands are his tools. And they're banging away on each other like that. It's crazy. Uh, what we do is we have, we look at two situations in a way. Someone who's a beginner, you want to teach the proper punches with the feet, hips moving with their body. And they work on the right technique. And then they, you stay in the midst, and you don't change distance too much, you're making sure that technique is correct. Now once a person can have pretty good technique when he's stationary, you want to take that person, make him be able to do that in the course of a fight, so to speak. Now, if you're able to do mid work, like sparring, 
where you're moving around, I'm changing distance, I'm changing angles, you're throwing what you want to throw, and I'm catching him without banging him, I'm catching him relaxed, and knock him away. And when you're open, I'll tap you back with the gloves. You gotta pay attention to defense, you gotta pay attention to distance, angles, range. You're sparring without getting banged out. I used to work with Felix Camacho a while, many people did. Felix, when he had an actual fight coming up, he said he would much rather do 12 rounds or 15 rounds of mid work with me than spar with two, two or three guys because he got more out of it. Distance, angles, he didn't get banged out, he could throw what he wants, that was good. Well, when Mark came visiting us, we did mitts together for the first time. I love, I love working with Mark for several reasons, as most of we talked about previous, the previous one, you know, with the Army guys. But this guy is unique, and he was a great fighter. He never did miss the way we did it. Mark, let's talk a little bit about what you saw with the miss. I oh, yeah. we, we had fun with the, the, the gym. Yeah, I came down a few months ago to the 20th anniversary. I worked out in the gym at the SJC gym, and I started working mitts with, with Steve, and totally different the way he, um, he worked the mitts. It was hard to, to adjust to, because it wasn't just, you know, one, two, three, throw one, two, three, you know, and you, you slip the punch, you know, go over the punch. It wasn't like that. It was just, he was here in the, in the round and holding up the mitts, and you threw the punches that you wanted to throw, and he threw, he, he might have, you know, the top you with the, with the pad, you know, as a punch, and you had to slip or block the punch, but it was just like sparring. After, I only did one round, but it felt like I sparred. <coughs> it was like, it was like, it was like I sparred that entire round because I was throwing the punches that I wanted to throw and I thought I saw open and he, he, he was coming back with, with stuff. You know, not hard punches, not hard um, slaps with the, with the mitts, but just enough to let me know that he's throwing a punch back at me. And, um, you know, serving a lot of purposes. One is conditioning. <clears throat> I, you know, I felt like it I was better for your conditioning than, than, than regular throw one, two, or throw, you know, three, four. And, um, it saves, it saves your brain because you're not getting hit in the head like real sparring. So that, that it made a big difference in that. I think that can replace sparring in, in many ways. If you're, if you're injured or you have a you know, black eye or, or a cut lip and you can't spar for a while, you know, doing a mid sparring, is, you get the same benefits out of it, exact same benefits. Are you going to use that style of mid now instead of using the other style? Or are you going to incorporate both of them? Or are you both? Oh, yeah. That's now that's something that you, you really have to learn how to how to how to how to do it. You know, and that's something you, it's not just you throw one or two. You, know, you, you have to it's something you have to you have to go. You have to be able to be a fighter. If punch is coming at you, you gotta know how to not get hit if you don't know what's coming at you. So you know when I was talking about reading punches too, you have stuff that we, we used to call uh, rolling with punches. Jimmy, you know rolling with punches. You don't hear that too much anymore. A punch comes at you and you roll the power away, correct? But what you don't see fighters today. They get hit flush and they come back flush, right? Go back and see Duran, some of the greats. They, they roll their punches. Now, what that is, think about this logically. You got a stationary target. You got a punch coming at you. The full power of the punch is there, right? You got the target coming at the punch. <coughs> multiplies it, right? You got the target going back with the punch. It takes away the power, right? So in your clock, in your computer brain, in your head, part of reading it, you know how fast they throw, and you know at the distance, you know everything about them. If that punch can come at you, and you can take that punch and move back the same speed as the punch, the same distance punch, there's no power on it, theoretically, right? That's what you have to be able to do. You take away the power of punches. This is what we have to get back. I hope that somebody somewhere can pass on the knowledge of Jimmy and Kenny and the deceased guys like Emmanuel, who was great. And uh, I used to watch Ray Robinson get in the mirror, and he used to do this. He arrived with the punch. Yeah. And he threw the hole. That's right. Years they ago. Throw it, they throw right hand? Yeah. You roll it. They arrived it. Right, and come right back. And come back right yeah. into right Years yeah. ago, when, we're, when I was in the Air Force fighting in Europe, yeah. these hockey tournaments, yeah. we would take the heavy bag, throw it, throw it out so it's parallel to the ground. Right. When a bag comes in, you'd lean on it and let it and roll off of it and come back. Okay. We would do that. 
Well, we had a new fighter in the gym one day, uh, watching that. And he goes out there on a the bag, he throws that bag out there, and he leans into it, and the bag drops him, and the bag's swinging over top of him. One of the crazy guys in went over and started counting on it. <laughs> Didn't have a roll. Justin's been in our gym. I'm going to tell you a little quick thing about Justin. Justin was an old wrestler in high school who was playing music, guitar, downtown Fort Myers once a week and got up to about 265 pounds or so and decided to get in shape on a, as a, once in a while. So he stops in the gym and started training. Somehow got addicted to it. So he's there every day except when he plays music downtown. And he started researching the old fighters because that's where you learn. Mm -hmm. And he's now, he fought last night at 178 pounds from Tucson. And you know, you're, he lost most of that in the first seven months, right? Mm -hmm. Now, who do we look at? Come up with some, some name from the past. And what's your experience in the gym with us? Uh, my experience in the gym has been uh, nothing but uplifting. Um, <clears throat> like you said, I lost about 75 pounds, 70 pounds. And uh, I didn't go in there to be a fighter, I went in there just to get back in shape and uh, I don't know, Steve's training uh, made me believe in myself and made me want to become a fighter, so I appreciate Steve with all my heart. I also want to bring up another thing, you see, they, fight, they, fight, they listen to music when they train. To me that's the worst thing in the world for a couple of reasons if you think about it. Rounds are three minutes long. Most songs are three minutes long. Songs have one rhythm. They go in there and train one rhythm. They don't change up and down. Boxing, you have to constantly change up and down, back and forth. You've got to change the rhythm. You've got to have the rhythm in your head. You've got to pick it up, slow it down. You can watch a fighter, and they can't change their rhythm because that change, like they train like that at the gym every day. Listen to music, one rhythm all the time. That's all they can do. You pick it up, they're lost. Slow it down, they're lost. you got one rhythm. You can see that. There's a lot of other fine points I won't get into now because of time, but you can learn them clinching, you clinch always on top, that way you're in control of the clinch, you can walk the guy around, you can lean on him, you can break when you want, you can then hit on the break if the referee hadn't said a word because you broke it, but if you're inside, you're at the mercy of the referee to break it up. In the old days, fighters would put a little Vaseline on their sides, tie the guy up, they say break, you just go a little bit, they pull it out and they got Vaseline on the glove and you got a face and they slide off a little easier. <laughs> we don't have that today. <laughs> now the other thing is, you go into a, into a gym. You should not work on what you're good at. You're already good at. It. <laughs> work on what you're not good at to get better at that. I had a kid one time. His hand was bad, right hand. And he had a good, good right hand puncher. I can't train. He comes in. He was so depressed. I can't train for a couple months because my hand's bad. I said, that's the time to train. You already got a good right hand. Spend the time. It's healing to perfect your left hand. Then when it's better, you got two good hands. The kid did, and that's what you do. You work on what you can't do to improve, because what's good is already good. Just like a fighter comes in the gym, trained by someone else. You don't start training, changing everything with that fighter, because if you look at them, you know there are some things that are good. There are some things that are bad. You never want to change what's good. Leave that alone. Take away the bad, then start adding more good to them. Okay? You go in the gym, and they work on the bags. They work on the, each bag is different, right? The heavy bags, the speed bags, the double end bag, right? Their opponents are all different, too, right? Tall, short, fast, slow. You don't want to work on one bag only. It's better to go one round on every bag than six rounds on one bag. Keep rotating and, and change instantly. And that's what you want to do. You want to constantly be different. It comes with being able to step inside of a puncher, change your level as he's throwing. If, if he's throwing at your head, you come down low, slip in the punch, you're there. Go to work in there while you're down. I hate to see someone drop under a punch and then come back up in a line of fire. Right. Right. You're down there, <coughs> bam, then come back up top and go there. I would make sure the fighter is taught to keep that mouth closed all the time. Especially if you're in range. If you're in range, you can hear the bird be breaking jaw. These guys make it sound. Ah, ah, now it's open. They're right in range. Not only can you hear them back down on the tired when they get tired, they tell you when they're punching their mouth open. Yeah. Broken jaw. Right. This guy fought a guy. This guy here, Oscar fought a guy. His nickname was the Weasel. I forget his name. Something the Weasel. 
<laughs> the bell rings, he runs across the ring, he hits him with an uppercut, left hook, and turn around, and he goes, pop goes the weasel. That's <laughs> <laughs> Oscar here. I'm going to leave you with one humorous occurrence, which I, I share with a couple of guys, that I, I think is such one of the funniest things that happened. A brand new fighter making his pro debut, all excited, anxious, all hepped up, tells his family and friends come out there. The bell rings for the first round. He runs across the ring into a right hand and drops immediately. He's down, didn't have any idea where he is. The referee goes to pick up the count, the corner trying to get his attention. Finally, he looks to the corner and they yell, get up at eight, get up at eight. The fighter looks at the corner and goes, what time is it now? <laughs> True story. The referee is laughing and waving the off. That's got to be one of the funniest things I've ever seen. That's true story. I had a good time with it and I love coming. These things to me are highlighted here. I see old friends, I see new guys. I see people that I knew about and never had a chance to meet. Like Grinnell Dahl, was, I remember watching him fight and I loved it. And I'm glad he's here for Kenny because Kenny I've known all these years and he's finally inducted. So this is what I love about these weekends. Get together with everybody, have fun, spread the word, get it better next year. And I leave here with a, with a thought, enjoy everybody while you can. You don't know when you leave if that's the last time you see someone. That's right. You do a good job. All right.